All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, um, I've got a few people from my company here. So if I mess up, I'm sure I'm going to hear about it. But, uh, but I will have to make a correction to the program. When I was a kid, uh, or at least uh, going through graduate school, I heard that you weren't an expert unless you were 50 miles from home. And I grew up in Cary, North Carolina. That's about 20 miles away, and I was born in Raleigh, North Carolina. So correction to the program, you only have two experts, and I'm not one of them. So, uh, okay. But I hope you'll enjoy my talk. So, uh, Dr. Honeycutt, I appreciate you. Excellent speech. I learned a lot there. And you wore a tie, so I grabbed one out of my bag, and I'm official. I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> talk to me in 30 minutes. You won't find my tie, though, okay? And I feel guilty about that. Uh, okay. So let's have some fun. Um, you know, when I, uh, when I left Monsanto in 1985, I was with Monsanto corporate offices yesterday we were doing some alliances with them. And uh, it brought back some memories of 30-some years ago when I turned my company vehicle in. I went back to school at NC State, and I was working on hard-to-control weeds and conservation and no-till systems. And uh, my first presentation at the Weed Science Society of America, all the, uh, the graduate student contest, right? They said, uh, you sounded like a salesperson. You were slick. I didn't like your presentation, you know, and they killed me on the evaluation. So I, over the course of the next year, I worked on my monotone speech and my statistics and my regression analysis. <laughs> and I'd like to report to you that um, the year later, 1986, I won the uh, Southern Weed Science Society speaking contest. <laughs> and I was, I was very boring, okay? Seriously, um, what I'd like to do is uh, share with you, I did win the contest, is you told me if I hit the wrong button, all my slides disappear. So that's the right button. So that's who I am. Um, I'll show you a cute little slide here. This is five generations of my family. This is my grandfather, uh, Sam Blackwell. And granddaddy was a tobacco farmer. He lived in Oxford, about 40, 40 miles north of here. And he didn't do soil tests. And uh, he farmed. We put 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, whether we needed it or not. And uh, no conservation tillage. When it rained, all the clay soils were washed out the end of the rows and right into the fish pond. And I couldn't fish mat for two weeks because the ponds were so muddy. So Granny didn't know a whole lot about soil health or soil conservation. And then we fast forward, um, you know, five generations. And this is my granddaughter, little Haley. And this is grand, proud granddaddy, and that's my son. And just found out last week I got to have a grandson in and, and six months. So yay, you know, second grandchild. But you know, we've come a long way. I've learned a lot in my career about soil health, um, primarily because when I was at NC State University, we were working on conservation tillage. We were working on alleliopathic compounds and how some of these things that were being excluded from rye were suppressing pigweed and other grasses and so forth. So it's real. And uh, you know, I, my first job out of the industry when I got back out of Virginia Tech and got my PhD, was actually uh, working with uh, what is now Syngenta. And I'll just give them a compliment. I'm not speaking for any company, Monsanto Syngenta, but I will compliment them. When I was with ICI, I spent three years as a conservation tillage expert, promoting no-till conservation tillage. So really appreciate that effort in driving those kind of markets. I'm really good through my career to see a lot of companies like Syngenta, Monsanto, and FMC promoting uh, sustainability. So that's kind of uh, my, my promotion for them. Um, Real quickly, what I'd like to talk about is just a little bit about myself. You heard that I you know, have a degree in agronomy and soil science, although I'm not an expert, right? I'm not 50 miles from home. But I did work also with FMC for uh, uh, 11 and a half years becoming, before coming to work for Rhodesian a year and a half ago. And even when I was at, with FMC, we had these sustainability models. We were really interested in soil health and water conservation. We had these huge spider charts that we would put together. And the bottom line was this. If the compound was not safer, more environmentally friendly, better to the soil, and we didn't go there. We did not spend that next $50 million, $20 million to develop a compound that was worse than what we already had out there. So, you know, just one example of my FMC experiences, uh, how we were really trying to work on, you know, sustainability and soil health. What I want to talk about real briefly today in my uh, seven or eight minutes I have left is a little bit about Rhodesian, some of the challenges that we have, and some of the solutions that we have in our company. Okay, so Verdesian basically is a company, it's a merger of six different regional companies. We're a venture capital company, um, excuse me, private equity, but we're an innovative company. We're involved in row crops, specialty crops, turf and ornamentals, as well as lawn and garden. Uh, we basically have a lot of biological, nutritional brands, as well as some technologies, you know, to, to round out the N, P, and K um, in the soil, okay? 
So here's a little bit about our pedigree. Uh, we're now called One Verdesian, and I heard an interesting comment, and then Matt from my lab here, I like to teach with Matt, but um, verde, right, means green in Spanish. So I told the people for the longest time, hey, we're a green company, and then Matt said, no, we got that off some building in New York City. I was like, darn, man. You know, I thought, I, I like the other version a lot better, but I'm not sure which, you go with either version you want. We are a very green company, though. Um, so real quickly, you know, we merged with Biagra. Uh, that was the first company that Payne and Swartz and Partners um, bought. And we had a lot of uh, nitrogen and phosphate management things. We did a lot of contract research with um, Los Alamos National Lab for nutrient efficiency um, products. And we have those in our portfolio. And a lot of scientists there, and they did more than make the atomic bomb at uh, Los Alamos National Lab. Um, we also bought uh, NAP, Northwest Ag Products, and that's where we really got into our sterics and nitrogen and phosphorus um, materials. Uh, we then we bought um, plant side to give us a European flavor and access points. We then bought a company out of Indiana called Intex, and that was our microbials, our rhizobia, that you put on soybeans for nodulations to improve soil health as well. And then probably one of the biggest things that we did as a company, one of the larger purchases was uh, SFP, especially fertilizer products, and some of the Palmer technology that we inherited from them, which we used to spray onto fertilizers to manage nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium losses in the soil. So we feel like part of our soil health story is managing the loss of nitrogen. And our final company is a micronutrient company. Okay, this is the three pillars that we operate under, and uh, basically, whoops, I can go back, right? Yep, sure can. Um, this is our soil health. What we're really trying to do is lower nutrient rates um, basically, the chemicals that we're putting on there to lower nutrient rates with these uh, long chain palmers is basically very friendly to the soil microbiome. So we're not hurting by the other bacteria in the soil, and we think that's a positive. We also have a lot of work that we're doing with water quality. Obviously, we can keep nitrates and phosphorus in the soil and out of your creeks and rivers and going down into the water tables. That's a great thing. Doing a lot of work with leaching ability uh, in the soils and also lowering application rates. We hadn't really got our heads around this too much, other than to say that we got a lot of good products that are PGR related, and they help a lot with plant growth. Okay, so we know this. Uh, we just heard this from Dr. Honeycutt about uh, we have 7.3, 7.4 billion people in the world. We're going to 9 billion. Everybody wants to raise crops and feed the world, um, and we also have areas of sensitivity where we have high nitrogen input as well as high water tables. So we have to watch these kinds of things. Real quickly, a quick definition: soil health is a it's all about soil quality and its capacity to function in vital living ecosystems, sustaining plants, animals, and humans. Okay? So when I started to work with ICI Zeneca, now Syngenta, I was in a conservation tillage, and we talked about, we had these t-shirts that said, farming ugly, you know, farming no-till, you know, don't worry about so many weeds, put the weed out there, put the rye out there, put the hairy vetch out there, it's good for the soil, less runoff and everything. And uh, it's very true, even today, that, you know, we're in our company and most companies, we're promoting conservation tillage for good reasons, you know, increasing soil organic matter, soil structure, and increasing the soil biological activity. There's a lot of work in my last company that I did with FMC working with microbes, you know, the bacillus species and so forth. And there's a whole bunch of, uh, and a whole bunch of those in that pond that we're mining. But basically, we were looking at cover crops, but now what we're looking a lot at is the biological materials. We have a Biological material, for example, that controls cheatgrass in, in north, uh, northwest of the U.S. There's 100 million acres of cheatgrass. It causes a lot of fires and everything. But we have a biological material extracted from the, uh, the soil that actually controls, uh, controls a weed. And we think we're going to be able to commercialize it. You know, here's, a, here's something that we all know. It's actually from um, the Food and Agriculture Organization. But one of the biggest concerns that we have is, yeah, we put the nitrogen out, but we lose half of it before we ever get it into the plant. And then how do we make that better, right? The other thing that we're really concerned about is once we get it in the plant, the plant's not always that efficient, a nitrogen use efficiency at getting that plant into the uh, grain that we harvest. Okay, I think I'm doing okay. Some industry things that I think are really important and paramount to us is that is the four R's, making sure that we have the, uh, the right source, and how we're gonna manage nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients, making sure you're using the right rate with the right placement at the right time. Absolutely critical. We're going to protect our soils. We're going to protect our soil health. We don't need to be using any more fertilizer than we have to. So it's all about placement and, and good management and good stewardship. And our company is all about that as well. You know, we talk a little bit about in our company about the nitrogen stool. And what we do there is, look, you're going to put the fertilizer out, 
but can you put other products out there to make it more available? Can you put other products out there to make the nitrogen use efficiency better? Because if it goes into the plant and it goes into our food, and not through the soil profile, then we're doing a lot better for ourselves and the environment. Um, real quickly, three forms of nitrogen loss in the soil, and uh, they are volatilization, leaching, and denitrification. And if you've got good glasses, you can read the, read the fine print, and I don't think I've got enough time to go into those in, in great detail. I think I've got maybe four minutes left, something like Please that? Please go ahead. Okay, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure, because I, I know I was a little short of Dr. Honeyguy there, so I don't want to get yanked off the, the stage with a big hook or anything like that. So um, really what our company has done as I start to wrap up here, I've got like four slides left, is one of the things that we did from uh, um, specialty fertilizer products was they had these highly charged palmers. Now you think about palmers, and there's a lot of them in nature. You know, silk is an example of a palmer. Um, cotton fibers is an example of a natural palmer. But we also have palmers that are synthetic like polystyrenes, Teflon, for example. These are all palmers. What we've done is we're not just doing these Palmers to coat nitrogen and phosphorus for the sake of, you know, slow release. What we have is these highly negatively charged 1,800 milliequivalents per 100 grams of soil. You think about a sandy loam soil that has Dr. Honeycutt maybe what, CEC of 10, 15, 20. These are a thousand times more active. So what we're doing in a small micro environment within the soil is we are spraying these palmers one for nitrogen, one for phosphorus, a different one for potassium, on the nitrogen to make them more available, to protect the phosphorus from things like calcium, magnesium, iron, and aluminum. So basically our approach there is protecting the, uh, the key macronutrients. Here's, not trying to sound like a commercial, but here's one of our products, it's called Nutrisphere. It's a nitrogen fertilizer management. Basically we're working in a microenvironment of the soil. We're controlling three forms of nitrogen loss trying to keep the nitrogen more in the ammonia form versus the nitrate or nitrite form, which has a negative charge, soils are negatively charged, and they go through the soil profile. They're water-soluble palmers that last throughout the season. They, they last for the whole uh, season long, and they have a really nice environmental footprint. So we think that's absolutely critical. Here's a little bit about the phosphorus cycles. You know, go, we could spend days talking about this, but the bottom line here is this. Very little of the phosphorus that's applied to the soil is actually in the solution, and plants eat what they drink through the water, through the solution. So even if you have a thousand pounds of phosphorus in the soil, maybe only one or two pounds is actually available. So what we're doing with our Palmer technology is basically this. That is, we take our we take the phosphorus fertilizer, we apply the Palmer around it, and that protects it from the magnesium, iron, aluminum, and calcium, uh, all these positive cations. It still makes the phosphorus available where it can get out and be available. So that's my talk, that's my granddaughter, she's digging in. I mean, she's loving the soil, and we love the soil at Rhodesian, and I know in my experience in the ag industry, they love the soil too. So from an industry perspective, I wanna thank you all for your time, very much. <clears throat>